Hi, hello again. Today we're going to talk about a startup company that I had the opportunity to participate in, in fact, as president of Valadco. There are some lessons to learn here that hopefully will be useful to you. Okay. This is a presentation that I gave to several classes uh, last winter uh, on leading a sort of pork production company. Now, uh, you might ask, uh, you know, why pork? Uh, well, because oftentimes when you talk about uh, starting a company, we well, want to have something that you're passionate about. So was I passionate about pigs? No, not necessarily, but I was passionate about the success of this company. This was one of the most intellectually interesting and challenging jobs I've ever had in my life. Uh, and as we'll, we'll talk a little more about that as we go along. So although I don't particularly care for pigs or the smell, uh, I did like pork and I did like this challenge. So here we go. Mm -hmm. Yes, in, in September 1994, I accepted the role of President Chief Financial Officer of Valatco. This is a cooperative of 100 corn growers who sought to sell their corn by selling their corn on the hoof, by growing pigs and feeding their corn to the pigs. But they lived in a place and grew these corn in a place where it was quite a distance to market. So the cost of transportation to the market meant that the, the price they got for the actual corn was pretty low. So they thought if they sold it uh, you know, by feeding it to pigs first, they could make more money. So prior to taking the job with Velatco, I was working for Ag Capital Company, a wholly owned affiliate of R.D. Offit Company in Fargo, North Dakota. R.D. Offit Company is a colossal, colossal vertically integrated potato growing company. At that point, I believe they were growing potatoes on 39,000 acres of, of land, all irrigated, uh, plus uh, the rotation crops of corn and soybeans. Last I heard, they were growing potatoes on 63,000 acres in 12 states. So this is a very, very large potato growing company. When, when Offit uh, decided to purchase a, a French fry, fry plant, he went to the St. Paul Bank for Cooperatives because he heard that they loaned money to farmers. Well, he was told the bank could not loan money to him because they only loaned money to cooperatives. So, hmm, so he asked, uh, well, how do I become a cooperative? Well, how he was organized was he worked in many, many partnerships. He would find a farmer who grew, would grow potatoes. He would be in a partnership with that farmer. Uh, the farmer stayed on the farm and, and managed the farm and often provided the financing, the inputs, the tractors, the harvesters, the marketing, and so forth, and, and they would split the profits. So he, he organized many of these, these partnerships into a company called a cooperative ag capital company. And then being an agricultural cooperative, then it could borrow money from St. Paul Bank for Cooperatives, which could then loan, ag capital money could then loan money to Hardy Offit Company. So um, he, he purchased this French fry plant along with a potato flake plant and a potato chip plant. So, so um, Ag Capital Company was loaning lots of money to RD Offit Company. So there was a concentration of risk uh, in the portfolio at Ag Capital Company. So I was hired in 91 to expand the non-member business. So um, I sought out very large farmers in five states around Fargo, North Dakota to loan money. So um, I, uh, one of my first deals was to loan money to a farmer that uh, was actually a $3 million deal. Um, a very, very complex uh, transaction, but uh, we made it work and I soon figured out that uh, any loan that we made took about a fair amount of work, whether it was a quarter million dollar deal or a $2 million deal. So from right from the start to working with that capital company, I focused on large, large farms. Um, I was actually uh, transferred, uh, one, of my, one of the customers that capital had was transferred to me to deal with, he called Hector Farms, and they farmed over 16,000 acres of corn, soybeans, and sugar beets. So the sugar beets is, uh, was, has been a very, very profitable crop. As you can see, um, the U.S. price for sugar uh, on this red line uh, was significantly higher than what the world price has been. 
because uh, despite uh, the support for free trade in the United States, sugar is very, very well protected. Uh, not only does there are there tariffs, but there are also quotas. So sugar beets have been a very, very profitable crop for these farmers. So I wanted to get into loaning a lot of money for uh, a lot of these sugar beet farmers because they had strong balance sheets uh, and high income. So I conducted a series of farm management uh, seminars um, and I wanted to create a reputation as an expert loan officer. That and with the implied endorsement of Hector Farms as my customer made it very easy for me to attract additional large loan officers. So in three years, I was with Ag Capital Company. I only had 25 customers uh, with a loan portfolio of around $50 million. Uh, this is a lot of money compared to an average loan officer in agriculture that had about $7 million portfolios. So uh, this was, this was, I was quite successful in this effort. Um, several of my customers borrowed money through Ag Capital to finance their equity purchases through Val Adco. Um, Based on a financial projection model that I received from DeKalb, and DeKalb was the source of the breeding stock that Valatco uh, used. Um, and then I took this financial projection model and improved it with input from pork industry experts from Iowa State University. And, and this was really a state-of-the-art financial projection model over a 10-year period on a cash flow uh, projection. The, 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 uh, the model showed internal rates of return on equity capital invested of about 20%. Uh, this was uh, you know, really extraordinary and, and, I, and I thought unrealistically high. So I had these projections reviewed and confirmed by other pork industry financial experts at Iowa State University. And they said, yeah, this model looks good. Uh, you know, that looks like all the assumptions are, are valid. Um, this looks like a great deal. So. Now, each of Ag Capital customers' loan requests had to meet the five C's of credit. That is character, you know, how, how good a person they were, the capacity, did they have the income to repay the loan, did they have capital, what was their balance sheet like, did they have enough equity uh, compared to the debt they had, um, was there, did they have collateral to secure the loan, and, and the fifth, um, test is what kind of conditions would you put in the loan agreement to, to make this all work. So each of the cu customers that I loaned money to through Ag Capital had to meet these five tests. Um, now, Valadco uh, had to choose the form of business. And similar to uh, most other countries, there's, there's at least three different forms of, of businesses that to choose from. A sole proprietorship or partnerships or corporations. In, in the United States, to, to for, meet certain tax laws, it's a little more complicated because there are sole proprietorship, general partnerships, where everybody is, is legally liable for the debts of the uh, partnership, or limited partnership, in which uh, the limited partners are not legally liable for everything, just the general partners of the limited partnership were. Uh, and then there's a limited liability partnership and limited liability companies, which is sort of a hybrid. And then for smaller corporations, you, you have the option of being a subchapter S corporation. Now, all of the subchapter S on up in that list are what do you call flow through entities in that any of the income or, or losses that are incurred by those businesses flow right through to the individual's income tax returns. In contrast, uh, chapter C corporation pays its own income tax uh, and then if it pays dividends, those dividends are then, all, then taxed at the individual level. Well, in the United States, there is um, actually another form of, of business that's available to farmers called a cooperative. Uh, through the Capra Volstead Act of, I think it was 1906 or thereabouts, uh, Congress authorized farmers to get together and form cooperatives. And this was sort of an exception to the antitrust laws at that time. So it was not a re no restraint of trade or whatever for farmers to get together to form a cooperative. This was also a type of pass-through uh, entity. Now, when you look through these uh, forms of businesses, um, you, you, 
when you go from limited li limited liability through uh, agricultural cooperative, all of them have limited liability, which is an attractive thing for investors. Um, all of them are flow through taxation, as I mentioned, with the exception of Chapter C Corporation. Um, only in the sole proprietorship and a general pro proprietorship partnership do the investors have direct control of the business, however. In all the other uh, types of, of businesses, um, boards of directors are elected, um, and then they are the ones who run the business, usually through one of the bigger um, entities through, a, through hired management. Now, another, another feature of these co companies is that uh, when you get through the limited partnerships on down, uh, when the principal owners of the business die, they continue. But in a sole proprietorship, when a business owner principal dies, uh, the business uh, you know, needs to be illiquidated. In a general partnership, the business needs to be liquidated, perhaps purchased by the, by the surviving partner or whatever. Um, so, but um, one of the real critical things um, is that the way you, you consider when you, what, well, what form of partnership that you, you select is, do you have access to larger pools of equity capital? As any big organization, uh, any big business needs a considerable amount of equity to support the debts that they might get. So a sole proprietor, uh, you're pretty well locked into small uh, sources of capital. General partnership, a little bit bigger, a uh, little more opportunity for equity capital. And then, it, then as you go down the list, you have more and more access to large sources of capital. With a chapter C corporation and the agricultural cooperative having the biggest uh, available sources of capital. Now, um, we want to look at the industry setting. Whenever you do a business plan, this is one of the elements that you look at. Um, and as we talk about this, so we'll look at a whole lot of different um, things uh, or elements that go into a business plan. This, this uh, presentation is not a presentation of a business plan, but a history of a uh, story about this, about Valadco. But um, uh, a lot of the elements of a business plan will be presented here in this presentation. So the industry setting was the pork industry was in a transition from many, many small pig farmers with maybe 100 to 200 mother pigs. Now a gilt is, is one that a pig, a female pig that hasn't had li any litters yet, any babies, and sows and have one or more uh, litters. Anyway, they're going from many, many small pig farmers to fewer, much larger operations. The industry is also transitioning to how farmers replace their breeding stock. Um, in the small farms, so typically they produce their own breeding stock from animals that they had, you know, born and raised there. Um, but uh, to get access to more productive, more, uh, more uh, re with pigs with bigger litters and, 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 and lower body fat, um, back fat, uh, Farmers were beginning to buy their breeding stock from uh, breeding stock companies, and Valatco was one of the breeding stock stock companies. So that was the way to get better genetics. So the industry was facing very good demand for its products uh, as well, uh, the finished meat, because uh, the industry was advertising pork as the other white meat. Uh, that, you know, trying to copy obviously turkey and poultry, uh, other poultry. Um, and as, and, the, and exports were doing quite well. So, so where Vladko fit in this uh, evolving industry uh, was that the leader and chairman of the board of Vladko was Kurt Watson. He's a very high energy dynamic man who fit the entrepreneur stereotype of being a visionary and having a willingness to accept risk. He was a big man and very articulate who had the ability to dominate others a bit more than was desirable. The other four members of the board were also leaders but Kurt was definitely the alpha male. Now, uh, before I go into further in talking about Valadco, uh, as just an aside, now this is a time in Minnesota when, when many, many farmers were looking to, to look for ways to add value to the crop that they were producing. Uh, many other corn growers like 
uh, like the sugar beet producers, who are many of them who are members of Atlatco, they had a cooperative for a southern Minnesota sugar beet cooperative. So they would pro process their raw sugar beets into, you know, a finished product sugar that could be sold. Other corn growers were making corn syrup um, and so forth. So they were, they were looking to add value to the, to the crop that they were growing. So, uh, so Valadco really, really stands for short for Value Added Cooperative. So, anyway, at the time I began to work for Valadco, it was just an embryo of what it was envisioned to become. I was the eleventh employee um, at the time I joined. That uh, the we Valadco was purchasing their grandparent stock uh, from DeKalb and one site with twelve hundred and fifty sows and then producing uh, their baby pigs and putting them into the nursery. The chief operating officer was a former DeKalb employee with lots of pork production experience, which that was a good plus for a new company. So the typical breeding gestation and farrowing barn was on, on one uh, site. So the, the sows were, or, or gilts were bred, um, and then they had their pigs in, in uh, and while well, they went through the gestation period in, in the breeding area barn, when they're brought to the farrowing barn for, for when they had their litters, and then the, when the pigs were anywhere from eight to 20 days old, then they were brought to a, a nursery. So this is a, this is a big operation, a, a big, really, farm factory. And uh, as you can see back here, this pond here is a lagoon where the manure would be flushed out from underneath the the slats of the floor uh, and, and manure would be flushed out into these, these holding ponds or lagoons. Now here's a picture of the sows in the crates inside the barn, just to give you some idea of the scale uh, with the feeding tubes that would drop the feed in front of the pigs. Um, so during my time at Valadco, we built two 2,500 sow farrowing barns and nursery barns to accommodate the wean pigs. So uh, with an average of 20 marketing hogs per year, uh, per sow, times 6250 sows, we, through our contract finishers, were producing about 125,000 select gilts and market hogs per year. So, you know, when, at, you know, while I was there, we had the initial site one, we had a site two and three with 2,500 sows, so, you know, that's the 6,250 uh, sows, and then we had two nurseries, one smaller nursery and then one larger one. So, the sows give birth in the farrowing barns, um, and they have anywhere from 8 to 13, 14 piglets, uh, and they put, uh, they're in these crates uh, that protect the piglets so the mother sow doesn't lie on the pigs and, and crush them. Um, pigs grow uh, until, you know, they're ready to be brought to the, the, the nursery. Um, and they're herded onto a truck and brought it out to, to the nursery barns. Uh, once you get to the nursery barns, they're put in pens uh, and uh, fed all these feeders like this. And then after, they're, when they're about 50 pounds, they're brought to a finishing barn site. This was one of the sites with uh, a number of, uh, you can see there's a number of eight, eight barns on this site. Uh, also, again, uh, with the manure being flushed into a, a lagoon. So if you know, each, one of these, each one of these barns would hold about 1,000 pigs that go from 50 pounds to about 240 pounds. So you can imagine a, a little city of 8,000 pigs uh, can produce a fair amount of manure and, and could create Quite a smell. So, and once inside inside the finishing barn, they're in in again in pens with usually between about about twenty pigs per per pen uh, until they are brought to either market or sold to other farmers as breeding stock. So, uh, one of the things you have to look at in any business plan is creating an organization chart. Just who reports to who? Who are the people involved? And here in this Art Valadco organization chart, 
you can see that the, first of all, there is the, the 100 corn growers elected board of, a board of directors that I mentioned before, with Kurt Watson and the other four. And they then chose a president, which I eventually, uh, my title from a, a president and chief financial officer evolved just to sim my simply being president. And we hired a chief financial officer who handled more of the finances. Um, also, I mentioned before, we had a chief operating officer, uh, Eric, from previously worked from DeKalb. We also hired an environmental specialist who was responsible for evaluating other sites for other future farms and dealing with our manure issues. And so um, another important uh, function in any company are your human resource uh, folks. In this case, we had our board secretary he also acted as our human resource person. And then under the chief operating officer, we, we had farm managers and then had uh, barn employees under that farm manager. Um, the chief financial officer also had an administrative assistant. So th these six of us were in the central office and then we had the, the, the barns. <clears throat> so what we really were trying to do was trying to produce the finest pork product, finished pork product at the consumer level at the lowest quality, lowest possible price. So we wanted to focus on quality and price. Um, but so it was up to us to how do you figure, configure your pork production facilities to maximize the throughput per dollar facility cost. In other words, you didn't want to have empty facilities at times, and yet you needed to have enough facilities to accommodate the, the number of pigs coming through. So we really had to figure out how many pigs we're likely to have uh, coming out of the farrowing barns uh, each week uh, so they could go to the nurseries and, and, and then from the nurseries on to the finishers. So um, doing this uh, throughput analysis involves the concept of theory of constraints. So in the theory of constraints, what you're doing is you're looking at an entire system and looking for bottlenecks in the system. And you look for bottlenecks because that restricts how much throughput, how many animals, in this case, you could put through the system. And to reduce your average total cost, you want to lower your average fixed cost, which means you want to do the maximum amount of throughput or the minimum amount of fixed cost. So that was really what we were trying to figure out. Um, and um, so we really it all started by really figuring out um, really how many pigs you're going to get out of your breeding gestation and lact and, and, and farrowing barns. And um, so really, um, I'm going to go into some detail here just to kind of show you the kinds of calculations you need to go through in any company. Of course, a different kind of company would have different kinds of calculations you would need to do. But uh, just to give you an idea, um, so for each, each litter, on average, uh, you figure 21 days. You figure after, after the pigs are weaned, uh, then the sows could be rebred, seven and a half days on average. Um, so altogether, either, either, either recovering or, or lactating, there's 20 and a half days. Um, each, each pregnancy of a, of, a, of a pig would last about 114 days on average. So total days per, per litter is 142.5 uh, days per litter. Okay, so you divide that into 365 days and you get theoretically 2.56 litters per year. Okay, um, now the trick is um, to try to catch the sow uh, on the first uh, estrus after, after, the, after the mother pig is weaned. Uh, very soon after that, she becomes capable of being impregnated again. So if you miss that first day, then you got to add another, um, another bunch of days. Um, so um, you don't always hit your um, theoretical litters of 2.56. So um, do, with, with good um, heat detection, the heat is when the sow is receptive, receptive to being bred, uh, with good heat uh, detection, uh, we get close to 2.5, uh, 6. So we assumed in our in our projections 2.5 liters per sow per year. Um, so uh, to do that, uh, you had to, really had to achieve conception on the first heat 
for 90.4 percent of the sows, which which is which is possible, but but it's aggressive. It, you need to be good at it. So um, so now in the handout, uh, I go out in, into great detail into the part for reproductive physiology because it. You, you had to learn an awful lot about pigs and, and the reproductive physiology to really understand all this and how to maximize the system. Um, so uh, I'm not gonna go into detail here, but just be aware that in any, any production company that you're, you, you're dealing with, um, there's a lot of details. Lot the, 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 the devil's in the details. So but all of this is to point out that getting sows rebed on the first heat is an art not totally a science. Um, and the goal is to minimize the non-productive sow days per year. And that is, they eat, to be productive, they either have to be pregnant or, or lactating uh, or recovering uh, for, for a short period of time. So, uh, and this is what's necessary to maximize the number of pigs born per litter. Uh, and then number of litters per, or litter of pigs per year. So, okay, then to plan for the optimal nursery and finisher space, we needed to predict, predict the number of animals at each stage. And all of the above is based on average. And again, with an animal system, this is we have biological variation. So the actual results never are exactly what are, were predicted. Sometimes the numbers were greater, sometimes less. So that's the trick of, of sizing your facilities right. You needed to have enough but not too much. Uh, so where, where was the flexibility in the system? That's where you have to figure out, where should the bottleneck be? Um, so the art of managing the system was then to adopt tactics that would minimize the variation and techniques to deal with that inherent variation. So when we looked at um, the average wean per, per week, uh, we had 60 crates in a farrowing barn of 1,250. We, that, would, that would have 645 pigs wean in, uh, per, in a week. Um, so um, they were in the, the nurseries for average of five weeks, 35 days. So we needed space for 30 to 170 piglets. And ultimately then they would go to the finishers and they're uh, basically usually they're about 124 days on average uh, to the, go to market weight. So we needed space for 11,192 finishing pigs for this 1250 sow um, initial site one. And then we'd go through similar calculations for site two and three. So where should the bottleneck be? Where, if you have insufficient capacity, where should that be? Um, we decided that the best, best place would be at the finisher level where we had other options for the feeder pigs than putting them into our contract finishers barns. Now I've mentioned contract finishers a couple times a contract finisher is someone that we would have a contract with who actually owned the barn. And by contract, we would supply the pigs on a regular basis. Uh, we would provide uh, the, the feed and so forth. Uh, and they would, but they would manage the, the actual pigs, the actual feeding and taking care of the pigs. And, and then, then we would uh, have the output from that. So they, they got paid on a contract. Um, it, and uh, we, we we did did this so we would have to have less equity, less money tied up into into facilities. Okay, so anyway, besides putting the pigs into these contract finishers, if we had excess, there was always a market for feeder pigs at, at 45 to 50 pounds. Um, we could sell them to other producers who were willing to raise them on their farms. <clears throat> So in this process, I developed a new barn design that was enormously more profitable, at least in theory. Uh, but I didn't get a chance to implement it, this design until I was with another employer, uh, unfortunately. Um, the, this design was most easily implemented once a farm is converted, into, converted from natural bore service, uh, the bore impregnating the sow, to artificial insemination, AI. No, that's not artificial in, uh, intelligence. That's artificial insemination. Um, the, in, in artificial insemination, you collect the sperm from the top one or two percent of the best boars uh, with the best genetics that have the best growth, ca growth characteristics and 
low body fat, which was desired by the industry for because we wanted low fat pork. Um, so you get one from the top one and two percent of the boars instead of eight to ten percent. So you have much better production from the the, the offspring of those things. So uh, that was highly desirable. So AI was was really really preferred at the time, and this new barn concept really used uh, AI as the benefit. Now I give you all this detail not to train you to how to be a a pork producer, but to illustrate the kinds of technical knowledge that you need to effectively run most businesses, not the things you're likely to know straight out of college. When we return, we'll we'll go into financing, but for now, that's it for today.